Now we're going to start this very interesting panel on lives, livelihood, and land. And we have five, five presenters, so we'll be very strict with time, so you have time to ask questions. I'll introduce them as they talk. Our first speaker is Patrizia Biamar Genzano. Uh, Patrizia is a social scientist and gender specialist who's conducted ethnographic research and gender analysis in relation to the feminization of agriculture. Um, she's currently a visiting adjunct professor at the Center for Latin American Studies and the Women and Gender Studies program at Georgetown University. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you for having us. Uh, thank you for, to the selecting panel. Thank you to Admira, to Hagar, and uh, thank you to uh, my um, panel um, co-associates who I just really wanted to, um, I want to emphasize that uh, all of them have been uh, Lipica. You are always at <laughs> time to join. Uh, they are former graduate student, uh, former um, Georgetown student, and we still have one major who is uh, uh, Felma, who is a graduate student as well. Um, uh, my presentation is going to be a little different and our presentations, I think, are going to be uh, just a change of page. We're not going to talk about uh, you know, women in literature. We are not going to talk about famous women. We are going to talk about everyday women. We are going to talk about women who produce food, women who produce fibers that makes our clothes. We are going to talk about people like us, but people who really change their, the life of their communities somehow. So um, we are going to talk about women's and the voices of these rural women's empowerment. So um, this presentation is going to delve into the feminization of agriculture and women farmers worldwide. Uh, each of us has chosen an area study, a country or a region or a commodity that we would like really to share with all of you but it's just at the heart of the women farmers where we want to focus. We look at women and their economic empowerment. We think that is, is a precondition for them and for their communities. In my case, I'm going to talk about two case studies, a world apart, I'm going to talk about women in Morocco and women in Peru, who coincidentally focus on biodiversity conservation and uh, an economic uh, avenue for their communities as well. And probably uh, what changes a little bit our dynamics is we try to give, um, to give recommendations to policymakers. We think that having the uh, fora at uh, Georgetown University, we can tap into, those, uh, into this arena and give recommendations for policymakers. So a little bit um, here, I just want to show that these uh, publications here are just, uh, I would say, in the last 10 years, we have been focusing on gender and agriculture. Gender is, you know, gender studies are deep and have a story by itself. But gender in agriculture and how the international community, this is the, the case of the women's empowerment in agriculture, uh, the Feed the Future and USAID um, um, strategy. And here I just wanted to show if it's, yeah, the, um, um, the state of food and agriculture that uh, was published in 2011, focusing specifically on why we need to, to have a gender lens in uh, agriculture. So just to give you a, a sense where we stand, our public, we look at uh, women farmers, and we know that women farmers comprise between 43 to 50 percent of the agricultural labor. We are trying to debunk the myth that says that women are in the 80 percent. It's not. We look at women being 43 to 50 percent of agricultural labor, that changes a lot regarding the area studies in the world. Being Latin America, the, um, um, the, where we have less representation. Uh, coincidentally, Latin America is the, is the area of the world where we have a higher representation of women in education. And then we change to a 50% in Asia and 60% in Africa. So 
we look at women as economic actors. But we have, uh, as all over and everywhere in the world, women have normally do not have access to land, technology, financial assets, less education, and markets. We're going to focus a little bit more on markets. With all these, um, and according to FAO, we, uh, Food and Agriculture of the UN, uh, it was a study that uh, point out that uh, if women have the same opportunity and the same access to seeds, uh, uh, all kind of inputs, and land, obviously, we will improve production on a 4%. That 4% translate into a 12 to 17% of people who could be nourished, who could be food secure. And all this brings, at the end, approximately 100 to 150 million people, most of them in developing countries. So uh, this is just a chart that shows in the last three, uh, 30 years, look at how much uh, I don't think I'm doing a good <laughs> uh, work with this, but you can see that Latin America is the, um, uh, has the less share of female workers in agriculture, but Sub-Saharan Africa in the last 30 years have increased as North Africa as well as Asia. The only region in the world that decreased is Europe. <clears throat> so uh, having said this, I'm going to present two studies two case studies. These case studies determine women's participation in, you know, in the value chain. Value chains have been adopted as one of the best strategies to mm, transform commodities, and could be any commodity. Could be uh, quinoa in the Andes, could be uh, rice and beans, could be anything. So when we look at this kind of uh, value chains, uh, it's been, I would say for the last 20 years, a push to bring women into these value chains to support women's empowerment. What we have found, and in my case, I've been following in some different countries uh, besides the one I'm going to present, how much women are involved in the value chain without being part of a strategy, a government strategy or a development strategy, and what does it mean to them to be part of this strategy? So uh, we look into the entry points, the constraints that women face, and obviously try to provide recommendations for policymakers, but at the same time for the women farmers themselves. The two case studies I'm going to present, and they come not parallel in time, but parallel in the sense that uh, they have a commodity at heart are uh, the case study of women argan oil producer. <clears throat> argan oil is a commodity that uh, has exploded in the, it's called liquid gold. And uh, um, the prices in the international market, particularly in Europe, are very high. And women actually work days and days and hours cracking nuts uh, for very few dirhams. And um, they are the backbone of the whole industry and economy. Uh, this is the case of, and each of us is going to present the narrative of a, a woman, the, the, the life of a woman. So in our paper, if you read our paper, it will be her voice, it will be her story. So um, Fatima Sadi, who is a social worker and lives in the Atlas Mountains, in uh, Talila Urga, in Tagasut, uh, Morocco, and a world apart, or another woman, uh, Doña Rosita Ferroñan, uh, an indigenous woman from northern Peru, she is the leader of a very small association called Huaca de Barro. Huaca is uh, just um, like a, an amphora, like a, you know, a, a nice base. And uh, she lives in Lambayeque and is the leader of this small group of women. So both of them have parallel, uh, parallel case studies, and I'm going to delve into these issues. Um, in, first of all, we look at uh, Morocco and the oil, um, argan oil, very lucrative industry. We look at argan oil as being a very interesting and um, very strong uh, <clears throat> um, entrance of, divide, uh, of uh, commo the commodities, very strong, and uh, is very important economically for the country. And, but we found that uh, it's all 
even though that becomes ma more and more modern and uh, uh, industrialized, it's just a very con con contextualized to the Berber community. The Berber women are those who produce the argan oil. Uh, 15 years ago, it was not known all over the world. Today, as I said before, it's called our, uh, liquid gold. But nowadays, with uh, L'Oreal, BSF, and many, many, many uh, other interesting companies, particularly from China and the EU and the US as well, they have a consistent market <clears throat> for this uh, argan oil. Uh, another thing that changed the uh, situation of these women, these women farmers, because they are women farmers, is that in 2008, the uh, government of Morocco adopted the Morocco Green Plan, or the Maroc Berg, the Plan Berg, the, or Maroc Berg, how is it? <laughs> She's my French translator. <laughs> so um, the Morocco uh, government adopted this very interesting approach, supporting uh, grassroots development. And because of that, women were allowed to gathering cooperatives. We will see at the end of the presentation all the, I mean, we did an assessment and we found out what was in fact the big, uh, the big problem that these women have and how they can uh, um, benefit from, from an approach that uh, the Morocco Green Plan. So we had that nowadays there are approximately 5,000 women cooperatives I'm sorry, 200, more than 250, but with 5,000 representatives. And this work was conducted in 2013 for the uh, ICARDA, which is the International Center for Agriculture in the Dry Areas. So, wow, um, going fast. Um, I just wanted to show this. This is a value chain. Look at the women. The women have to collect, transport, transform, produce. They get to the business, but they do not manage the funding because that is male dominated. So let's go back. That is the main constraint we found. Changing, let's go to Peru. Let's put the women on hold in, in Morocco. We look at the endemic species. Do, do you know that a, a cotton is not white? Cotton is colorful, <laughs> but we have, um, we have used the white strains. <clears throat> so this color cotton is a, a unique variety that is endemic from Latin America, but particularly from these areas of Peru. And it has been supported and being kept alive by indigenous women. In 2008, the same thing that in Morocco, women farmers uh, have a lift. Uh, and they, the government of Peru supports uh, color, uh, native or color cotton as a, a um, heritage of Peru. So these two cases, these two women uh, groups, we found that in this case, another value chain, we look at that women have, again, uh, no access to land, they don't have access to transportation, but they do exactly the same. If you see, the whole value chain shows that the women are the backbone of the color cotton or the native cotton value chain with the lack of control of income. The action-oriented research that we conducted is in the north, we see and, uh, the women in Morocco and the uh, tier, the, down, the tier at the, in the uh, bottom is the women in Peru. Women were extremely open and extremely uh, vocal of their needs and then we, we got to the issues that affect women. So we found out that women across the globe and women in two very specific and unique commodities try to stop the overharvest and the, the biodiversity erosion that brings to uh, you know, indiscriminately use the commodity. So we look at argon, at cotton, and we found that the women's isolation is the worst problem that they uh, support, that they face. We look at the loss of competitiveness, competitiveness when women are isolated, the lack of land tenure, the lack of access to uh, you know, uh, any kind of uh, transportation or processing materials, the lack of education extension, 
the need to get small loans, and they were not going to get this by themselves. So women like Doña Rosita or um, Fatima came together and formed these small cooperatives that now are much running due to the uh, enabling conditions in Morocco and in uh, um, Peru. However, the fact of male-dominated markets is not changing much. And uh, this is a little bit of analysis of empowerment. So when we talk about women participation, women participation, yes, in the value chain gives empowerment, but it gives them a huge amount of work. They don't have any free work. They participate in the value chains. They form cooperatives. And I want to emphasize this, if it's something I wanted to, to put forth, women's association is key. If we do not have this possibility, women will not get aspects of you know, fairness, literacy, access to markets. And women, yes, they are empowered. They don't need, perhaps, the value chain. What they do need is a fair uh, gain, a fair society, fair uh, laws and regulations. Um, and just um, because I have to, to uh, wrap up, I just wanted to say that value chains and any other uh, um, strategy that we try to push, to for, to impose, needs to be consulted with community, needs to be studied by women, with women, and for women, because we might be damaging the social fabric of the community if we, as educated uh, you know, uh, development workers or academics, bring this to the forefront without their knowledge. And one thing which is important, man, men should be part of the solution. Without men stepping in, being part, working with us, things are not going to change. So uh, my, my view is very uh, comprehensive, very hands-on and oriented. With this, shukran, thank you very much. And uh, I let my um, <clears throat> co-workers. <laughs> Our next speaker is Harmony Kobange. Uh, Harmony is originally from Paris, but she has a degree in international politics and African studies from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Uh, after graduation, she joined Physicians for Human Rights, where she works in the program on sexual violence in conflict zones. Good afternoon, everyone. My presentation will be based on uh, field study work that I've conducted in India in the summer of 2014 as a Circumnavigators Fellow. Rural women play a vital role in agriculture and rural development in all regions of the world. As women produce more than half the world's food production, bear the responsibility for food safety and maintain the well-being of their family and whole communities. Women comprise approximately 43% of the world agricultural labor force, but women secure access, land, women secure access to land tenure in developing regions of the world is constrained by discriminatory policies governing access to productive resources for agriculture and livestock. In a field of one's own, Dr. Bina Agarwal argued that the most single important factor that hinders women's empowerment is the existing gender gap in command over property. In South Asia, for example, arable, arable land is the most significant form of property. And as a result, land is a crucial determinant of economic well-being, social status, and empowerment. Nonetheless, a handful number of women control land and very few women own land in South Asian countries due to the prevalence of complex barriers on to women's access to land tenure. As I mentioned, um, my uh, presentation is based on the 
uh, field work that I've conducted in the state of Uttar Pradesh in India in the summer of 2014, where I interviewed um, 99 development experts, government officials, civil society actors, and rural women in three villages. And I was also um, fortunate to have interviewed Dr. Bina Agawa, who was kind enough to uh, open uh, open her home to answer a few of the questions um, that I had. In India, rural women often do not own land outright because land ownership is usually reserved for men who are considered to be the traditional heads of households. This concept of male at the, um, as the head of households has been at the heart of land titles, which are, are called uh, patas in India, which has uh, largely been reflected in local perceptions, custom, as well as in national accounting systems, government programs, birth certificates, and mari marriage certificates as well. In that regard, women ha often have a limited role in decision-making processes of their households, this institutionalized gender dimension in land ownership often invisibilizes women and make them vulnerable along with their children in the event that their male relative dies or sells their family's um, land. In India, an estimated 71% of the population lives in rural areas and women currently account for 49% of the rural population across the country. Though India possesses 11% of the world's um, arable land, the country has to feed 18% of the world's uh, population. And, for, and because of that, the pervasive existence of gender-based discriminations against women negatively affects this task to, of providing um, food to um, the population. Um, gender inequalities in ownership and control of land in India are often influenced by many factors, which include social, cultural attitudes, religion, class, and caste-based obligation. This gender gap in land access not only lowers rural women's status in society, but as I also mentioned, negatively affects the food security of millions of people in rural areas because women do not produce as much food as they might where they, um, if they were able to uh, have secure access to um, land. So uh, for the purpose of my study, I decided to go to uh, Uttar Pradesh, which is India's most populous state, and which is also um, famously known as one of the states with a huge amount of uh, pervasive um, gender-based um, violence. So I visited three villages and conducted um, three focus groups with rural women, thanks to um, USAID um, there and to a local NGO called uh, Arrow. In the state of Uttar Pradesh in India, women are the gatekeeper of the produ productivity of their households. And the land tenure system in um, the state of Uttar Pradesh emanates from the Hindu Succ Succession Act though specific rules regulating inheritance show a strong preferences, so show strong preferences for a patrilineal system. And as such, the line of inheritance often goes to a male here. And women in that state can only uh, inherit a family land if in the absence of a male um, relative. And when I spoke with some of the women that I've interviewed, even in the absence of a male relative, it's often taboo for women to claim the family land that they uh, rightfully own because of the s social stigma associated with um, claiming what is theirs. So during my, um, what I interviewed women um, in the state of Uttar Pradesh, um, only 17% of the women interviewed indicated that they currently own land. And the remaining women that I've interviewed admitted to be sharecroppers and working um, other people's land. 
And from um, the information that I was able to gather from these rural women is that women who had um, a secure access to land and women who own the land and who, had, who have um, formal um, documentation to prove the ownership of the land, they were more food secure because they were able to um, invest in the land that they were working and they also had the security of owning that land, that piece of property in the event of um, any misfortune and they could actually use that plot of land as a collateral. And on the other hand, the women that I've interviewed who admitted to not owning land, most of which belong to um, Brahmin and also Shadow Caste, often um, share the sentiment that if they were to own land, they would be more secure because they would be able to keep the food that they produce and also um, invest in, um, in uh, agricultural uh, in input. And the, um, something that was really um, interesting during my research was that a few women um, admitted that although they think that um, securing women's land tenure in India is important, they were not open to um, their daughters owning land. So I found it really interesting because the, these women were part of the organization that I, organization that I pre, uh, previously mentioned called Arrow, which was advocating for women's um, secure land tenure. And I just found it interesting that these women advocating for um, women's right to land ownership were not in favor of their daughters uh, owning the land. And when I asked them why, they mentioned that India was a patrilineal um, country as uh, in general and that uh, they will be perfectly fine with um, their daughters owning, having access to land through their husband or um, their male relative. But um, I've also met um, several women who were in dire situations because they um, did not own land. And for that matter, most of the food that they were producing were for um, the landowner. And, and another fact that was interesting was the schemes of food insecurity within the household. So I was able to learn that um, in the traditional uh, household in Uttar Pradesh, um, the man, the husband was to eat first, then all the sons, then the daughter, and then the woman who was working the land would get whatever was um, left. Thank you. Um, so some, uh, because women secure land ownership influences decision affecting crops, whether for household consumption or for commercial purposes, it is important for, um, for us to, um, to fight for the engendering of um, secure land ownership for uh, women in developing countries. And for that matter, I was able, based on all the interview that I uh, conducted, I was able to um, come up with three recommendations, which I would um, highlight. Um, so my first recommendation is directed to the government of India and its decentralized authorities, including the government of Uttar Pradesh, to issue patas jointly to both husbands and wives. So previously, under the India Hindu Succession Act, um, like, as I mentioned before, the men uh, were um, considered to be the head of the household, but then this um, act has been amended since to uh, include a more um, gender-based um, approach. And so I believe that uh, it is important for the government to implement a retroactive program aimed at adding the names of the wives to the household patas in the event that the male relative um, dies. My second recommendation goes for um, national states and local authorities, along with uh, religious leaders who must fight against the social cultural constraints that hinders women um, land ownership. And as such, I believe that is, it is important for these authorities to um, conduct gender sensitization campaign because a lot of these gender-based discriminations in land ownerships have since been internalized by women who, in some cases, believe that um, they do not um, deserve to own the land, although they are the one who work the land from dawn to uh, 
too late uh, in the day. And my last recommendation is um, that the government of India help women, especially women from shadow castes or women who belong to um, the lower caste, to help them secure um, land because often these women do not have the means to buy a plot of land. And for instance, although there have been a lot of debates about microfinancing, the government of India should maybe come with a scheme that may uh, help these women have access to their own plot of land so that they could feed their families and their communities. Oops, thank you. Good timing. The next speaker is Elaine Corrigan. Uh, Elaine is a recent graduate from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. And at university, she was active in GU Fossil Free, an organization to urge Georgetown to give up its investment in the fossil fuel industry. And also, she organized with the Day Laborer Exchange Program. Uh, she's currently employed as a field, organization with three, a field organizer with 350 Action, which is building grassroots power to promote climate justice. Well, good afternoon, and thank you all so much um, for welcoming, welcoming me here to this stage. Um, I'm so honored to be at this conference. Thank you to the conference organizers, and also a big shout out and thank you um, to my research mentor, um, Dr. Patricia Birmar Genzano, and also to Mark Giordano, who's not here today, but who has been so helpful um, uh, to me in my academic journey. And so the title of my presentation is Gender, Environmental Vulnerability, and Climate Justice? Question mark. And the question mark is really, really crucial here because climate justice is a very new issue of gender justice that we're just beginning to explore, and also one that's in particular flux um, at this moment in time with international climate negotiations just gaining steam. And so my presentation is as follows. I'll talk a little bit about why gender is even important to experiences of climate change in the quote, global south, unquote, and then um, present the case study community in which I conducted my research, talk a little bit about participatory action methodologies, and give my analysis and concluding thoughts. And so, um, you know, by this point in time, most people are familiar with the uh, serious reality of global climate change. But something that's not talked a lot about is climate change as an issue of justice. And you know, around the world, it's, um, it's known that people um, with less income or in marginalized um, positions in society actually suffer more from climate change due to their increased resilience on primary natural resources. And as scholars began to um, highlight this, it became natural that feminist scholars would want to take part in the debate as women also occupy a certain subjectivity within this. And so they noticed that because women and men perform different daily tasks and have different roles and responsibilities, in addition to, use, in addition to utilizing natural resources in different ways, maybe there would be different implications for climate change for women and men. And so we talk a lot about writing women's lives, right, at this conference. But we actually need to problematize gender and sustainability. And the reason for this is that women are often portrayed as victims of climate change in the sort of gender and sustainability narrative. Um, you know, they're more harmed by things like droughts or floods, um, crop failure, erratic rainfall, because their lives and livelihoods are much more tied to those primary natural resources, whereas men have more access to um, financial credit and to markets, so therefore they're more um, in, you know, insulated from those sorts of climactic shocks. Well, I wondered if that really told the whole story. Does climate change impact women in this kind of way, you know, where they're, where they're victims? Or is there also kind of a side of the story in which they're empowered as agents of change? Um, and people have written about this, but I wanted to delve deeper into it and see where it, women's agency came into the picture. And this is a photo of um, a little girl. She's uh, making lunch in the community I was in. And so I kind of went over this, but yeah, what is the gender and sustainability narrative miss and how can we actually um, use the insights of research to make real change for people in communities suffering from climate change? And so I did my research in a small community called Yonda, and it's in the Région de Fatigue, which is right here where I put the red dot in Senegal. And this is just a, a photo of the village. You'll notice that there's a beautiful mangrove forest all around the village, which um, 
is actually the main um, ecological source um, of many of the activities that people perform um, daily in this village. And so here is a picture um, of men who primarily engage in fishing, and they fish for over 20 different species of fish. Um, and this is just a picture of them working with their nets. And even small boys learn how to fish and support their families that way. Women, on the other hand, um, buy this fish from men and take off the scales, process, smoke, and salt it for both local consumption and actually international export. Um, this is a fish oven in Dionda that was made by a different an NGO that I did my research with. And besides this, women in Dionda are constantly on the hunt for different clams, bivalves, um, things like oysters and mussels to supplement their income that they, um, that they earn by processing fish. Um, and it's really, really difficult work. I went out and did it, and it's back backbreaking work. Um, you know, in addition, women's time is occupied by um, doing things like um, mashing millet so that they can make uh, dinner, and actually cooking dinner, which takes a lot of time as well. Um, you know, cooking, cleaning, uh, taking care of the house, and harvesting firewood are also activities that women engage in um, disproportionately to, to men who don't do that at all. So how does climate change impact men and women? Well, when I arrived in the village, um, I was all set up to do a lot of interviews with women and go through women's value chains only. And um, you know, because this research paradigm relies on really close communication between the invited researcher and the community. And, but the person that I was mostly collaborating with was named Baba Kartjor, and he's the man here in the blue shirt. And uh, we decided together to do a series of mapping activities to better understand the, um, the gender aspects of all these economic value chains. But notice that I've purposely put a picture of a man here working with Babakar um, in my first slide. And this is because after my first meeting with him and some other people in the village, um, you know, explaining that I was a scholar of gender and climate change, um, he and his friends were very disgruntled. And one person said, Le Tubab, which means like white person or, or foreigner. They always work with the women. You know, why is that? Um, and so there was a legacy of aid in, in the region which had been actually very, very focused on women's projects and not really collaborated as much with men. Um, and so I thought, okay, you know what, That's, gender needs to take into account both sides of the story here. And so we proceeded to do um, many different focus groups, both with men and women, mapping out value chains and the different economic and environmental um, challenges. And this is a photo of Mer Awa, who was engaged in um, honey making activities just another interview, and Mamadou, who is an old fisherman. This is, um, so getting kind of to the uh, results of my 30 feet, 35 interviews with small, you know, just small uh, groups of people, about 14 women and 11 men. Um, this is the result of one gender analysis that I conducted. It's a little bit difficult to read as I was trying to write really quickly, but the, the letters here represent months of the year, and on the top represents um, women's work, and on the bottom represents men, men's work. And the green, um, the green lines are the types of um, activities that they classified as low to medium stress, both in time and physically, and the red line is supposed to be really, really rough um, stress. So they, women said that all throughout the year, they're engaged in um, cutting firewood, they're engaged in making bread, they're engaged in harvesting um, bivalves and clams, and they're also engaged in all the household activities. And then in their perception, if you go to the bottom, men's work, as you can see, the lines are much thinner, um, especially, you know, they're always engaged in uh, fishing and in cutting firewood, but not really other activities like caring for children or, um, or, and if they cut firewood, it would actually be for sale, not to bring home to the family, which is what they, they emphasized to me. Um, and so this is just a picture of the women with whom I did the, the gender analysis. And so after a semester of coding all of these interviews and many, many hours, to distill the basic insight of my research, what it came down to was that men engage, in, in Dirinda at least, in one economic activity, which is fishing. But fishing brings in a lot of money, which is why I put those coins and dollar signs. Um, and whereas women are engaged in a bunch of different activities that are smaller and bring in much less money, and in some cases, in the case of housework, no money at all. Um, and so these are just, this is just a picture of some of the codes that came out. Um, 
and about thinking about how women and men uh, actually interpreted climate change differently in that case. Um, it was interesting because both men and women um, highlighted the climactic changes that had gone on in the region, such as rain becoming um, less abundant, um, drought degrading the mangrove and making it less, um, less easy for people to fish, and, and you know, an increasing dependence on outside projects and outside interventions to make ends meet. Um, but the degree to which men and women were vulnerable to these, dif to th these things differed a little bit. And so I organized the, my results into three main questions. How has climate change impacted the environment? How has it impacted the resources you use? And how does this impact your well-being? And uh, the blue uh, categories here represent men's uh, responses. The red represents women, and the purple represents both men and women. And so women, as you can see, highlighted much more often biodiversity loss and issues like the depl depletion of mangrove resources, clams and bees, the, which they make honey with, um, as you know, things that were threatening their livelihoods. And men, not as much. They would mention you know, the deforestation of the mangrove and depletion of fish stocks because they're fishermen, but it was really only focused in that one, uh, in, in, in the sector of fishing. And as far as how does this impact your well-being, men really stress that climate change and the increasingly um, inhospitable environment of Dirnda, it's very hot, very salty and dry, um, made it much more difficult for them to save for the future so that they could um, buy a house and get land for their families. Whereas women cited much more immediate concerns like fatigue and work burdens that increased as well as food insecurity and a lack of you know, uh, nutritional food for their children. Um, and so this was really interesting um, for me to hear. And I think it challenged a little bit the standard gender and sustainability narrative, which is that women are you know, the, really the only ones who are hurting from climate change. Actually, both men and women um, are vulnerable to climate change and suffer from it. But in Dirnda, in Dirnda at least, um, these changes actually impacted them more through unemployment and the inability for them to save for the long term and com complete those, frankly, gendered masculine duties. And for women, it was more about the physical and social um, burdens that would increase, you know, much more time going out to gather firewood, or it was much more difficult to gain money by going out and harvesting clams. Um, and it was difficult for me to, there's this, you know, uh, in, in, impetus to want to quantify who's more harmed, who's more vulnerable. It was difficult for me to actually say that. In one way, women are much, it seemed that women were much more harmed by climate change because of those, that immediate kind of stress. But in the long term, men also saw their, um, saw their opportunities being lessened. And so um, thinking about some solutions, um, the women that I worked with and the men also wanted, um, I said, you know, if there could be a change in your, in your community, what would, you, what would you want? And they said, well, we want a better um, fish processing site and a market so that when the men bring in the fish, um, when we buy it from them, we can have a better and more sanitary um, uh, equipment to, to do what we do. And we'd also really like to make an agreement with male fishermen that um, whenever they go out to fish, a certain amount of fish that they catch um, will be allocated towards us and it'll be sure that we can buy it. Because oftentimes men would go out of the village and sell that fish to people or to inter you know, in buyers in the international market or other local markets and not sell it to the women because they couldn't pay as much, but that meant that the women didn't have any livelihood, right? Because women can't go out and fish. Um, and so that's, I guess that's, um, that was a really big point of contention. And then they also wanted a portion of the revenues from these activities to be kept for investment in reforestation of the mangrove, which was um, really suffering from the drought at that time. And so I guess my key takeaways are that um, Climate change impacts women and men very differently in different communities, and in Dirnda, at least, these are very acute um, impacts. But it's not enough, I realized, after being in this community for two months, to talk about ma making women and men more resilient to climate change, or how can we reduce their vulnerabilities. We do need to redu reduce people's vulnerabilities to climate change. But on the other hand, 
We also need to look at what the source of climate change is, which is a reliance on fossil fuels and the continued burning of fossil fuels globally, and our responsibility towards women and men, and, and particularly women, in that arena, in making those structural changes. Um, and the other key takeaway that I had was that Awa, who is the woman sitting in the uh, middle here, and her daughter and her mother, um, and other women like her who were engaged in so many diverse activities um, were really leading, in many cases, efforts to both um, revitalize the environment in these communities and also make sure that um, community development for their kids and their families kept moving forward. Not that the men weren't involved, but they were particularly um, I guess, animated actors. And so it was that optimism and, and, and courage and resilience that I also wanted to present as a key takeaway. Take Thank you. Um, our next speaker, oops, sorry. Our next speaker is Yufelma Chun and Wang Chun. She's uh, from Bhutan and is currently a senior at Georgetown University. Ufelma was inspired by internships at the National Environment Commission of Bhutan and Renew, a local NGO that supports women and children in Bhutan. She's conducted re preliminary research there and is currently working on opening up possibilities for rural women in Bhutan. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Imagine a country with no McDonald's and no traffic lights, even in the capital city. I come from that country, Bhutan. My name is Yufalma, and I'm currently a senior at Georgetown University in America. Today, may I humbly take this opportunity to present to you about land tenure systems and women's empowerment in Bhutan. In Bhutan, women take responsibilities both inside the home and outside the home. They are our strength, our pride, and the heritage because we are a matrilineal society. Where is Bhutan is a common question I often get asked when I'm outside of Bhutan and when I meet new people. And some of you might, ha might be having the same question in your mind too. Bhutan is just a dot on the world map in South Asia, tucked away in the Himalayas. We are a tiny country of just less than a million people sandwiched between two of the world's largest countries, India and China. But we don't feel claustrophobic since we're high up in the mountains and um, we're good friends with all our neighbors. In the next 10 to 15 minutes, I want to fly you all to Bhutan for a unique experience. Welcome to Bhutan. We have no flatlands, all mountains, but we have lots of green areas. In fact, Bhutan is the only carbon negative country in the world and promise to remain carbon neutral forever. Our constitution mandates that Bhutan should have at least 60% of forest cover for all times to come. We are a country that values progress in terms of gross national happiness than in terms of gross national product. However, we also have contemporary challenges. For example, let's look at the statuses of women in Bhutan. Women's representation in the parliament, we can count on our fingertips. We have only three women out of 47 elected members in the lower house national assembly. And we have only two women out of 25 members in the upper house national council. So overall, there are only five women out of the total of 72 members in the parliament. Similarly, women representation in the local government is negligible. In fact, there is only one out of 205 elected local leaders called GUPS. As you can see, the statistics is quite alarming. Women's representation in the government's civil service job is better, but it's not yet gender parity. Now against this backdrop, I did a preliminary study looking at land tenure systems and women's empowerment in Bhutan, as I'm very passionate about improving gender equality in Bhutan. My study covers the whole of Bhutan, dividing into four regions, the Western region, the Central region, Eastern region, and the Southern region. 
And last summer, I traveled across Bhutan to conduct participatory methodologies with mapping and focus groups under the supervision and guidance of my professor at Georgetown, who is also here today. Here are some of the pictures from my visits. Um, this is a picture of women farmers um, mapping their village in the east. And then men farmers mapping their village. And this is another small village called Saktin in the east. So the women farmers are mapping their village there. And then the men farmers are mapping their village. In Bhutan, by law, both men and women have equal right over land ownership, but the key findings from my research are interesting. In the Western region, land is usually registered in the name of the wife. And in the Eastern region also, land is normally registered in the name of the wife. And in the Central region too, land is mostly registered in the name of the wife. And only in the Southern region, land is predominantly registered in the name of the husband. So overall, in Bhutan, Land belongs to women, reflecting our matri matri matrilineal society. So in short, as per the law, both men and women have equal right over the ownership of land. But in practice, women have more right over ownership of the land. So my concluding message and hope that women's empowerment journey must go on and reach all sectors and sections of our society. Thank you. Our next and last speaker is Lapika Kamra. Lapika is a DPhil candidate at the Department of International Development at Oxford. Her doctoral research examines the relationship between state making, development, and counterinsurgency in rural eastern India. Uh, she studies how counterinsurgency recurs as a primary driver of colonial and post-colonial state making in regions associated today with the Maoist insurgency. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. In this paper, what I'll do is I will explore poor women's lives and livelihoods in a post-conflict context in rural India by pointing to the antinomies or contradictions of women's agency. Agency in the general usage of the term refers to the human capacity to act. In scholarly practice, it is used as a conceptual tool to study the choices made by human beings to act in certain ways in certain situations. Agency today has become a theoretical lens to analyze subaltern narratives, whether in literature, in autobiographies, oral histories, and in narratives emerging out of ethnographies. The concept of agency has been emphasized as a way to point out that even the most marginal and oppressed can exercise some measure of control over their lives and mold the course of history. The implicit opposition in these agency-centered approaches is with an earlier wave of Marxist and neo-Marxist scholarship that studied only structures of domination and oppression at different scales, from the local all the way up to the global world system analysis. Two analytic moves that have been made with agency as a concept are, firstly, there's been a shift from macro to, to the micro in terms of the level of analysis. And secondly, there has been a move from structural causes of events and processes to agency-centered perspectives in which individuals or collective actors are the decision makers. Liberal humanist notions of agency privilege the individual and construct a liberal rational subject who possesses sovereign agency and is assumed that only acts which are undertaken by these free, autonomous individuals can be truly agentic. This liberal notion of agency paradoxically pervades even radical writings on resistance and rebellion against social domination, where autonomy and sovereignty are assumed to inhere in subaltern classes or communities as a whole. Uh, Ranajit Guha's influential work on peasant insurgency in 19th century colonial India and James Scott's well-known conception, Weapons of the Weak, put forth this very idea of agency. The post-structuralist turn, however, helped us in moving away from these liberal notions of agency. Following Foucault, it was recognized that if subjects are produced at the intersection of myriad discourses and structures of power, the agency of a subject must necessarily emerge from within these structures of power and can never be independent of them. 
The concept of agency, however, was not abandoned, but it was taken to be non-sovereign, indirect, and socially structured, or non-autonomous. Uh, these conceptualizations of agency have primarily emerged from feminist and gender studies uh, scholarship and have helped us transcend the older binaries of agency and structure, autonomy and hegemony, and resistance and domination. A major contribution of this scholarship was to do away with the binary between agent and victim and helps us locate agency within and despite structures of power. Despite these theoretical advances, uh, however, um, which has taken the debate in terms of conceptualizing agency to the next level, I'd like to point out that any effort to locate and represent agency of subaltern individuals is bound to be problematic. I argue here that agency as a concept is very limited because it fetishizes and objectifies subaltern experience and sub scholarly practice. It is not subaltern agency, but an elite representation of it to make the subaltern speak. Furthermore, it's not clear what agency means in the social science sense. Since we recognize that even when individuals try to subvert power, they're still being produced by it. Then why not study the workings of power by themselves? As a concept, the importance of agency is linked to the rise of methodological individualism in scholarly practice and more recently to the rise of neoliberalism. Unlike Marxist collective notions of peasants and workers, methodological individualism understands social phenomena through motivations and acts of individuals. The neoliberal turn in global pol political economy takes this further and brings the focus back on individuals. Development organizations, NGOs, and even governments pursue an agenda where solutions to problems such as poverty are seen to lie in the empowerment of poor individuals through participation and self-employment. Empowerment in this sense is an agency-led uh, idea. In countries such as India, the shift from the state's role as a direct distributor of benefits to a promoter of so-called self-helping subjects is one of the ways in which the state has reshaped itself. In this agenda, poor women's agency receives special attention in development programs and anti-poverty schemes. Interestingly, what we see is that on the one hand, the agency of women assumes greater importance for NGOs and states which want to see women as rational economic agents. And on the other hand, the agency of women also simultaneously becomes an object of study for scholars. These two positions reinforce each other, and this leads us to a kind of academic common sense over women as agents of everything pretty much, development, armed conflict, and subaltern politics more generally. I make an argument here about going beyond agency as a conceptual framework to study women's lives. And I do this through my research on women and post-conflict state building in rural West Bengal, a state in Eastern India, in the aftermath of the Maoist conflict there. Since 2011, the Indian government has pursued a counterinsurgency strategy where it sought to wean local populations away from Maoist rebels by proposing new development programs aimed at empowering rural women. A program of microcredit was planned whereby subsidized loans would, were to be granted to, to women to set up small enterprises of their own. The aim was to tackle poverty, um, which was here seen as the root cause of conflict. And it was felt that by providing li livelihoods to poor women, the state will be able to access every household and resolve the problem of poverty. I'll show here how the state's desire to imbue women with agency and empower them fails to succeed because of the reinforcement of existing power relations and women's desire to seek, sorry, women's desire to seek patronage relations with state actors. The contradictions of agency in this context brings out the limitations of it as a concept and the futility of using agency as a theoretical lens to study subaltern women's lives. As part of what I call develop as the development as counterinsurgency strategy of the Indian government, it announced a program called Mukti Dhara, which literally translates as source of freedom. The idea was to empower women through taking loans and numerous meetings and training sessions were organized to prepare these women to become empowered subjects. Uh, Debashi Sen, a district level bureaucrat who was involved in monitoring the project said to me, we don't want to just push for financial empowerment for women. Our goal is to make them confident and bold overall. However, during the meetings, when women would be asked by state officials to speak about their business uh, plans and what enterprise they propose to set up, 
a few women were willing to speak up. Later, they would tell me that they don't want to start a business or an enterprise. They, in fact, came to these meetings for very different and unconnected reasons. Take the example of one of my interlocutors, Shumana Mahato. She said, I feel so important when I come for these meetings. I step out of the house and have the opportunity to talk to state officials. I asked her if she was looking forward to getting a loan. She answered, my family owns land. With the help of the local NGO worker in my area, I have managed to learn new techniques of rice cultivation and our yield has improved. So I don't really need a loan. Instead, it would be better if the government office gave me a job because that's the only way I can leave the house every day. Shumana's aspiration was not to become a self-employed entrepreneur through the loan, but to carve a space for herself in the public sphere through sustained ties with local state actors. She did wish to challenge some existing gender norms and step outside the household, but in a limited manner. Um, another woman, Shama, also said that she liked going to the meetings. She said, as women, we're always doing household work, but this is a good chance to come out and meet other women. It's a day out, we are provided food and we don't have to work at home. Another of my interlocutors, Prerona Das, said that her motive behind attending these meetings was to, get, was to get to know state officials better, who could help her later. She told me that um, she had been looking for a position within uh, what is called the Integrated Child Development Services, a government-run program, for almost three years now. She had appeared for the selection examination thrice, but was not taken in. She said that it was middle-class women with political connections who get all these government contracts and appointments. She too was hoping for the same and said that as long as I get a position within the government program, I'm happy. I don't care too much for a loan. As a result, state officials were often frustrated. The district rural development officer said to me, we are trying so very hard to empower these women, but the task becomes so difficult when they themselves do not want to get empowered. So all the women refused to become the autonomous, self-helping, rational economic agents that the state here was wanting them to be. They were very keen on forging relationships of patronage and dependence with the state. Women's agency in this context, if one were to call it agency, paradoxically is the agency to seek out the state and build sustained relationships of dependence with state actors in their everyday life. For many women, the meetings at the local government office were an opportunity to come out of their homes, abandon their domestic duties temporarily to undertake official work, and build relationships with state officials in the hope of receiving financial support or employment from them. Women identified the post-conflict state as a new patron in their lives and made claims to seek material benefits, enhance visibility in the public life of the village, and develop new state-supported livelihoods. If we think here in terms of existing notions of agency, we are in a conundrum. While women do re renegotiate existing relationships of power, existing social hierarchies, and to an extent existing gender relations, they also, seek, uh, they, they also shape and seek out new relations of dependence and subordination. If at all we have to use the concept of agency here, it would be to describe how new forms of dependence were being desired. So if agency here is producing its opposite, that's now non-agency or subordination, isn't the concept analytically unhelpful? It might be much more important to study how power works in these situations. Aradhana Sharma's uh, study of the Mahila Samakhya, a public-private partnership to empower women in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, and Lamia Karim's work on microcredit programs in Bangladesh have concluded that neoliberal development regimes reinforce, often, sorry, they often reinforce existing rural structures of power. Both these authors critique the idea of empowerment th that these programs seek to promote. While I agree with them, I want to go forward to make the point that so-called neoliberalism does not merely reinforce existing structures of domination, but also creates new ones. In the post-conflict situation that existed in my field sites, there is a kind of social change taking place, but instead of producing resistance, it creates new forms of subordination and patronage, which are not imposed only from the top, but they're desired from the below as well. The process of state formation during counterinsurgency here simply cannot be talked about in the binaries of power, resistance, and subaltern and elite. There's a fluidity which opens up the social to new practices of self-making. 
Foucauldian frameworks would rightly appreciate uh, the micro practices of power which are involved here. And post, post, sorry, post Foucauldian frameworks would go beyond this in pointing to the ways in which agency is shaped by power, um, uh, but, but that it can subvert this very power as well. However, even when agency is described as shaped by power, uh, the concept of agency as it has been come to uh, employ, has come to be employed today necessarily comes with the baggage of empowerment and resistance. Therefore, I argue for a move beyond agency in favor of a framework of self-making to study the complex textures, textures of subaltern women's lives. As an ethnographer studying the gender nature of the processes of modern state building and the status of poor women as developmental subjects, I would miss out on much if my focus is just on identifying whether there is agency or not. Self-making as a framework to understand the everyday lives of subaltern women in conflict development and state making is able to capture much better the myriad ways in which women in the state relate to each other within ongoing social transformations and therefore it goes beyond merely looking for individual or collective agency. Thank you. <laughs>